We are joined by Spencer Holbrook of Letterman Row. That's on Three's Ohio State site. And Spencer, this is about as excited as people have been for the Buckeyes since what, tw 2019? Ryan Day's first year when, as a head coach, when they, they had a loaded defense like they have now? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, but even 2019, um, you remember that Justin Fields went four of 13 in the spring game and looked, well, kind of pedestrian. And so the, the steam kind of went out of that in the summer. This year, it's full steam ahead at all times. Um, and all they've got to do is figure out quarterback. It's it's a tough. I've never heard, been like in a building that was that juiced up for a spring practice as I was on Saturday uh, when we got to watch the Buckeyes full practice. Well, and that's the thing. So you got to see Jeremiah Smith, the number one recruit in the country the next in the in the line of great Ohio State receivers. You got to see Will Howard, the Kansas State transfer, Quinchon Judkins, the Ole Miss transfer, uh, Caleb Downs, the Alabama transfer. I, it, it's so strange because I keep mentioning, I, I mentioned a freshman, I mentioned a bunch of transfers, but then you also, like, JT Tui Malau coming back, Jack Sawyer coming back, uh, mm -hmm. Ra Lathan Ransom coming back. Like, all of those people that... A lot of them would have been in the NFL, I think, if the season had maybe gone differently last year. It does feel like the, the, a similar situation to the one more run vibe that was going around Michigan this time last year. Yeah, and it's been that way all offseason, right? Like, they know what's at stake, and so they're not really wasting it. And I thought heading into Saturday, when we looked out of practice, like, we would see – uh, some breaks for Travion, for Quinshawn, for those defenders. But no, they, they went through the entire practice. And I think that tells you a lot about what the mindset of this team is. Like, hey, we can take breaks in the third quarter or fourth quarter when we're, you know, beating the tar out of Western Kentucky or, uh, you know, I think Akron's first on the schedule. Like, that's when we can get our breaks. We don't need breaks right now in the middle of spring. We need to be going. And, you know, that's not to say that they're not building that depth that they need, but also, like, those guys just aren't taking the reps off that maybe I thought the rest days that that maybe we thought they were having. They're they're getting their rest in for sure, but also like they're not uh, just because they're veterans doesn't mean that they're taking the spring off. And I think that's it's something that we had to be reminded of, but it's also something that I didn't really see coming because you know this is a, a really veteran group, and you know all of those guys like you mentioned, and, and the list keeps going beyond just the guys that you mentioned. But like the talent that came back is absurd you put that with the young guys that they believe are going to be able to help this team and and the collection of talent is just it's off the charts i've never seen anything like it in this building well and that's that's the thing when you say that about ohio state it, it jumps off because they've obviously had incredibly talented rosters but this does feel more stacked than what we've seen and now my, my question is is how does ryan day manage that and, and his staff managed that. It's not look, it's not abnormal to have two really good running backs like Travion Henderson and Quinchad Judkins, but it, it, do you have to balance that out, or is it one of those deals where, hey, look, there's enough for everybody here? Yeah, it's like a it's that everybody eats mindset, right? Like just because you're not both going to have 1,500 yards doesn't mean you're not incredible players. The receivers have been that way for a few years now where, you know, maybe they're not going to have three 1,000-yard receivers. They might have two, though, and they might have another guy who rushes for 500 yards. And I could see that actually being the same way this year because, like, you know, you've got Emeka Buka and Jeremiah Smith and Carnell Tate and Brandon Innes, and those are just four of them. And then in the running back room, you've got – uh Trayvon Henderson and Quinchon Judkins, but then you've also got Dallin Hayden, who's been a really, really talented back. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it might be one of those situations where, hey, we might have 1,000, 900, and 600. It doesn't have to be 1,400, 1,300, and 200. And so that everybody eats mindset may be uh, the best way to approach it. And then the defensive side is the exact same way. The defensive tackle is a great example. They absolutely love what they're seeing from former – uh, four-star prospect and former three-star prospect, Kaden McDonald, the th former three-star, Jason Moore, the former top 100. Those guys are the backups right now. They're second-year players. But the buzz coming out of camp right now is that those guys are are showing ridiculously good things. And when you've got Ty Hamilton, Tyleek Williams, well, now those guys might not have to play 50, 60 snaps a game. They might not have to have 13 and a half tackles for loss to make this defensive line uh, as good as it can be. They don't have to be out there, uh, you know, in the third quarter when it's 35 to 10. They can already be taking their breathers because the guy's behind them. So, like, it, it's that everybody eats mentality, I think, that's fueling this team right now. They know how talented they are from not just 1 to 25, but maybe 1 to 65. And then those last 20 are coming along pretty well as well.
One of the the things that the additions allowed that I think is the most interesting is we've you know we talk about how old that defense is, how established a lot of those guys are in their roles, but Caleb Downs coming and allowing Sonny Styles to become a linebacker. Yeah, that feels like maybe the most important move of the season of the offseason. Well, and it has a chain reaction because Sonny Styles being a linebacker now helps C.J. Hicks be, um, as Jim Knowles said last offseason, unleashed is what they wanted to do with him. Well, they're playing more traditional linebacker roles, and C.J. really couldn't do that. Saturday we go in there to watch uh, you know, the open practice that we had, and it's the only one we're going to get other than the spring game. And C.J. Hicks is blitzing pretty normally, and, and uh, Sonny Styles playing more of a linebacker. Cody Simon's playing more of a linebacker. They throw a third linebacker out there at C.J. Hicks, and he's more of a, a rush end or – you know, a, a blitz specialist up the middle that unlocks a different level for him. So Caleb Downs lets Sonny Styles come back to the linebacker room. Sonny Styles lets CJ Hicks kind of hone his craft as a pass rusher and what he does best, you know, sideline to sideline. That allows JT to him all along Jack Sawyer to kind of be freed up on the edges a little bit. The chain reaction of Caleb Downs is more than just, hey, you added an All American who had 107 tackles in his first ever college football season for Alabama. You added him. That's not just the, you know, where it stops and because it, it has that train reaction all through the defense. And I think that, you know, like you said, it's the most important part, but it's a part that sometimes we kind of overlook just because of how important that downs addition is for the entire defense. It just unlocked a few different layers that you're going to see late in the season. We're like, oh, yeah, I forgot that guy now can play that role because of downs. Yeah. Back to ransom. Well, and, and it's so interesting in the transfer portal era because – the transfer portals allow talent to move so efficiently that it's actually kind of hard for even the blue blood teams to have people exactly where they need to be playing. Like you may have to have a better athlete that you need to stick at a position that's maybe not his best position because that gives you your best 11. Ohio State, it feels like now they can put everywhere where they fit best as opposed to just trying to get the best 11 out there. Well, yeah, you saw that last year a little bit with Jordan Hancock. He's one of the best 11, bar none. He's, I think he's one of the most underrated players in the Big Ten, perhaps the entire country. The season he had last year was remarkable. Uh, he had to play the slot corner last year. By all accounts, he's very, very good on the outside. But with Dave Sinek-Benosa transferring in last year, he started with, with Denzel Burke. What did that do? It allowed Ohio State to play Jordan in a blitz role, but also in the slot corner role where he's very good defending those slot fades that are near impossible to defend. He is really good at, you know, being a willing tackler against run sets from that nickel spot. It unlocked that layer of the secondary where three of your best 11 are corners. Well, okay, well then that means one of them gets to go to the slot position instead of having a safety there. Well, this year is the same exact way. Hancock's still there, but like you said, Downs is now one of the best 11. He's one of the best two, and he's not number two on that defense, <laughs> which means Ransom is coming back also. Sonny Styles gets to go to linebacker, and then the whole front seven transforms into a unit that you're really, really relying on rather than one that after you lose two linebackers to the NFL and Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg, well, how do we replace them? Well, we don't replace them. We replace a safety, and then that allows us to bring somebody down, like you said. The way that they're using all of these pieces, it's got Jim Knowles salivating, but also – He's got to be careful, if I'm being honest, making sure that that there's not, you know, it's not too perfect in a way. And then he talks himself into some schemes that may bite him, uh, you know, down the road. And I think that's something that they're kind of working on this spring. Yeah, they did clean up the giving up the big plays last year. So hopefully they, they don't get back to that because that that was the one thing that defense needed to clean up. Now you've got to marry it with a, a better offense. And it, by all accounts, it looks like that's what's happening Let's talk quarterbacks because Will Howard comes from Kansas State. We saw him lead Kansas State to a Big 12 title a couple of years ago. He's big. He can run. He's got a decent arm. But Ohio State still has quarterbacks that were already on the roster. And, and Devin Brown's an interesting one because he didn't really get a chance in the bowl game to show what he could do. He got hurt so quickly. He was supposed That was supposed to be his game. We never really saw what, what he could be. So how's he looked and, and how has Will Howard looked? Yeah, they had some really good moments on Saturday. Uh, Devin Brown had one of the best throws of the day. Um, he uncorked one between two defenders to Bryson Rogers, upcoming wide receiver, um, who ran for a 70-yard touchdown. You're also seeing the, the throw that he had to Jeremiah Smith, which a little bit lofted up there, but 
Jeremiah is Jeremiah, and he's going to do that against any corner because he's doing it against the best corner possibly in the Big Ten in Denzel Burke. And then Caleb Downs is right there in coverage too. So, like, you know, they, these quarterbacks don't have to be perfect. But then you get Will Howard, who's such a run threat. He's not going to wow you in seven on seven. He's really not going to wow you in light contact 11 on 11. Where he's going to to make up for that, though, is when you get full, full contact – Bringing him down is really difficult. And Big 12 defenses will, you know, Jim Knowles could probably even attest to that from his time in the Big 12. It is hard to bring down Will Howard, and he just looks big out there. So Devin Brown's had his moments. He looks good. Uh, Will Howard's had his moments. He looks good. Lincoln Keenholz had some moments on Saturday that made you say, wow, he looks pretty good. And then the freshman, Julian Sayan, had a couple of the best throws of the day. Uh, just an incredible, incredible talent there. But he's a true freshman, so you wonder if that's going to, you know, hit a wall at some point this quarterback room is in really good hands and i think that you know as last year we were kind of debating on well if you have two do you have none is kyle mccord separating from devin brown if he's not is that an indictment on mccord or is that a good thing uh when you think about devin brown well i think it could be a little bit of both this year i think devin brown has taken another step forward and will howard has challenged him to do that and i think it's not a do you if you have two you have none it's you have two really good options and Ohio State could probably go with either of them and feel pretty confident. I still think at the end of the day, because of that 11 on 11 full contact edge that I think Will Howard has, I think that will end up prevailing. But I'm nowhere near ready to declare a winner. And I know Ohio State's not because Devin Brown has shown some really good things this spring. Well, it doesn't make any sense to declare a winner right now. I, I no. think, no. you know, you, you look at the, the circumstances of Will Howard's transfer, I would be very surprised if it's not him. But, you know, it, it's interesting you you mentioned that you know how hard he is to bring down. I, I think he's he's probably like a bigger version of Dorian Thompson Robinson, who Chip Kelly had in his UCLA offense for so long. And that's what I, I've had a lot of people ask me, and I'm curious from what you've seen so far, like how much of this is Chip Kelly bringing in a lot of the stuff he did at UCLA or how much of this is Chip Kelly taking over what Ohio state was already doing? Because I know he and Ryan days past diverged and Chip Kelly was just trying to build the best offense he could with what he had at UCLA. He's obviously got a little bit different set of personnel at Ohio state to work with. There was a lot more run diversity Saturday than I've seen in a couple of years at Ohio state. And I think that's a direct result of Chip Kelly. Um, that is it was fun to watch him, you know, kind of cook on Saturday against Jim Knowles in that defense. And, um, you know, we, there were a few different plays where uh, instead of handing it to the running back, you saw Will Howard and Devin Brown pull it down and run themselves. And it faked out a couple of the camera guys I was standing next to, and they were pretty upset about that. But it's, it's <laughs> that you have to be, you have to be very careful when you're defending this team because Quinshawn and Travion can beat you to the edge and, and score a touchdown on any play. And then if, if you got the quarterback who can pull it, and again, we saw that with Dorian Thompson Robinson ran it so effectively with Zach Charbonnet there at UCLA. Well, that was a Chip Kelly, Justin Fry offense. Well, guess what they have right now? A Chip Kelly and Justin Fry offense. So, you know, that can be very, very effective, especially when you mix in the talent that they didn't have at UCLA. They add that talent now at Ohio State. And the quarterback run, I think, is going to be a much bigger part of this offense. We saw it time and time again on Saturday, like I said. You know, the quarterback's just pulling it down, faking some folks out and scoring. You know, we saw a couple of touchdowns on quarterback run. I know it was two hand touch. They're not bringing the quarterbacks to the ground, but that's an exciting development because people at Ohio yeah. State have been wanting the quarterback run game for a while. And Dwayne Haskins didn't do it. Justin Fields didn't have to do it because they had a 2000 yard back and J.K. Dobbins, uh, but he did it some. Uh, and then C.J. Stroud, you know, I ain't no damn running back is what he said. And, you know, that's fine. <laughs> but uh they didn't run with him. And so until he had to against Georgia in that peach bowl. So they, and Kyle McCord certainly couldn't run as well as Ohio state fans wanted him to. Now you can't go wrong when it comes to running quarterback, Devin Brown, mobile, Will Howard. We know exactly what he can do with his feet. And that is music to chip Kelly's ears. I think chip Kelly's going to utilize those guys really well. I, I saw chips first interview session and he seemed like he had weight lifted off his shoulders. He, he, he talked about, I, I just want to be happy. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I think everybody looks at it from the outside. Like, why in the world would you leave a head coaching job for a coordinator job in the same conference? Well, Chip was going to get fired at, at UCLA this year, probably. And he's also not your typical college head coach. Like, I don't think he needs to be the boss to feel satisfied with his job like he he strikes me as someone who probably enjoys the football piece of it a lot more 
than any of the other stuff. Yeah, and the interview last year kind of piqued my interest when he was talking about, you know, all of the things that he would change to college football. And it just seemed like, mm -hmm. you know, all the things that they ask a head coach to do didn't really fit what he wants to do. Like, he would still be happy, um, you know, hanging out by the beach and also coaching football in New Hampshire if that would, you know, pay him the level that – that he's paid now. I think, I think it's safe to say that he would be happy coaching a high school team. If he was just allowed to, you know, focus on football. And that's the thing here is like, he wants to be a football coach. He talked about, he lost his quarterback's coach to, I think Oregon state uh, right before the bowl game. And so he had to become the quarterback's coach again for bowl prep. Well, what did that mean for him? It meant, you know, recruiting went to the side and some of the other things went to the side and he was able to just be a football coach again. He fell in love with that. He was reminded how happy he was just being a football coach. Well, guess what? Ohio State offered him an opportunity to just be a football coach. And he's obviously going yeah. to recruit. And recruiting an NIL and getting pulled out of a meeting room to go meet with a, an NIL advisor or go meet with, with a, a booster about something, that just isn't going to happen as regularly for him anymore. And, and it doesn't have to because he can be the quarterback's coach at Ohio State, the play caller. And, you know, some guys just want to coach ball. Some guys just want to be a ball coach. Jim Kelly wants to be a ball coach. Ryan Day gave him the opportunity to, and I think it's it's already working out really, really well. From what I've heard, those meeting rooms are intense. Um, those guys are all really good friends. Justin Fry, uh, Chip Kelly, Ryan Day, really, really close friends. But I think that also equals times where, you know, instead of getting in a shouting match about offensive strategy, you can't get over it because you're, you're not best friends with that guy. These guys can kind of brush it off and go, you know, whether that's get a drink or hang out afterward. Uh, and it's a little easier to do that. So I think it's a really good chemistry in that room. And, you know, Chip just adds something that they haven't had. And that's that, you know, football coach, football guy, uh, run game specialist that they needed. Yeah. And it's also, there's no yes man situation either because no. Chip Kelly is not going to back down just because Ryan Day is the boss. And no. Justin Fry knows both those guys really well. You're right. They, they, there's going to be a, a very collaborative effort. And, that there probably will be some challenging of one another <laughs> at times that, yeah. as you said, that relationship makes it easier to make that work. I'm looking at Ohio State's schedule, and it's interesting to me, Spencer, because we've done these deep dives into other teams' schedules in the Big Ten, and they all feel remarkably different. Ohio State's schedule feels like a kind of – this This could have been their schedule. And actually, probably could have been their schedule a few years ago when they were supposed to go to Oregon – and then couldn't because of COVID. Like the at Oregon game is the only one that may really feels all that different. Yeah, well, the the Western Michigan spot that you see there in week two was supposed to be a trip to Washington. Um, yeah, they canceled that series a couple months before the Big Ten added Oregon and Washington. And it kind of you know peaked their ears up. It's like, hey, what's going on there? Why did they cancel that? Well, they add Western Michigan, so there's also a bye week right after that Western Michigan game. So it's two games, it's a bye week and then it's a, another non-con that's that's just not a very good game against Marshall and then you dive into the the Big 10 schedule. So it kind of sets up perfectly for this team, especially if they've got still questions at quarterback or offensive line like they've got that ramp up where it's going to be pretty nice to get to that Oregon game and like you said, if you just moved that at Oregon up in between Western Michigan and Marshall, it would feel like a normal Ohio State Big 10 schedule. And that, it's kind of weird to say um, because it is yeah, because every everybody else isn't like that. Like, you know, you you look at where Penn State falls, and for Ohio State, it, it's you know kind of normal. Like, this is this is where you usually play at Penn State. Penn State plays plays them tough every year, especially in Happy Valley. But the difference is, like, Penn State will have played UCLA and gone to USC in the weeks before that, and go to Washington right afterward. Like Penn yeah. State has the weird one, but Ohio State, everything probably doesn't feel all that different. No, not at all. And, you know, you look at the Michigan schedule. It's a bad year to, to be hosting Texas early in the season. Mm -hmm. It's not a great year to draw Oregon as a home game. You'd rather, if you're going to have a potential loss on the schedule, you'd rather be on the road and you could get those those home games. You know, like the Michigan schedule looks far, far tougher than the Ohio State schedule. And that's kind of crazy to say because, you know, I, who among us didn't mock Michigan's schedule last year for what it was? Well, it's kind of uh, coming back at us when it comes to the Ohio State schedule because it's not the strongest schedule in the world. But the 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 dynamic between the Penn State schedule that looks pretty tough if USC is good, the dynamic between the Michigan schedule that we know the teams on Michigan's schedule are going to be good, and then the Ohio State schedule couldn't be any different. And it sets up perfectly in a year where Ohio State is absolutely loaded. 
Yeah. Now, here's the thing about Ohio State being loaded. In a four-team playoff scenario, in the BCS, you'd be looking at this and going, well, as long as they don't screw it up, they're yeah. playing for the national title. Now, when you, even if you win the Big Ten, you still would have to win three games in a row against really good teams to win the national title. So it doesn't guarantee anything, which I think is a lot of fun because – I do feel like if, if this were still a 14 playoff, we'd be looking at Ohio State as a pretty prohibitive favorite. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, you look at that Oregon matchup that could happen twice uh, because it could happen in the Big Ten championship game. Ohio State could get that first round by in the college football playoff, even if it loses at Oregon on October 12th, because the rematch, Ohio State could win the Big Ten and be one of the top four ranked uh, conference champions. So, you know, that trip to Oregon doesn't even seem all of the, all that, you know, important when you look at the rest of the Ohio State schedule, because they're going to be favored over Michigan. They're going to be favored even at Penn State. Nebraska could be interesting, but I don't think that's going to be too big of a battle. Iowa, I guess, if the offense is different, but who who ex actually expects that? Like the, the whole getting to the college football playoff thing here is all about winning the big 10 because you don't want to have to play that first game. And if you do have to play in that first round, it's probably going to be a home game anyway. So yeah. it sets up really nicely for them, no matter how you slice it. Um, but you know, they're talking about a 16 game schedule because they know a 17 game schedule means they didn't win the big 10. I think that's pretty. So, Spencer, let's, let's think about it this way. Here's, here's the craziest part. You just said that the big 10 may come down to a potential Ohio state, Oregon rematch. Yeah. Imagine saying that to someone 10 years ago and what they would have said to you. Yeah. What are we doing here? Right. Like, why, why are we here? And I still question, you know, why I'm not, uh, you know, looking forward to the pack pack 12 schedule, you know, release or whatever. Uh, but here we are. And, you know, with uh, Michigan who looks like could be a little bit of a rebuild, I, I'd still think that's more of a reload, but a little bit of a rebuild. I think Michigan's still going to be pretty good depending yeah. on what the quarterback situation winds up being. And, and that, Seems like something we're just not going to know until after the the spring portal window. So, yeah, exactly. And then Washington is almost in a complete retool. I, you know, you can't call it a rebuild; yeah. but it's a retool. New coach, new starting twenty-two. It seems like. And then yep. Oregon is loaded for you know what should be a, a really special run. Ohio State's loaded for what should be a special run. Penn State's kind of creeping back there in the distance with a returning quarterback, but some questions elsewhere. Like. The, the, the dynamic of the Big Ten does not look anywhere near the way it did a couple years ago. And it's not just because it added four new teams. It's because, you know, the program that's been at the top for the last three years is undergoing some major changes. Meanwhile, Ohio State is ready to pounce on that, and Oregon's ready to make a splash as they come into the league. Cannot wait. Every time we do this, I want September to be here sooner, and it's not coming any faster. So, Spencer, thank you so much, and uh, we'll, we will check back in uh, as the Buckeyes – wrap up their spring practice here in the next few weeks because I imagine they're going to be the team most people are interested in most offseason because it's it seems like they are just continually getting better. And with the expectations, well, yeah. it's going to be fun. Spencer, thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never – Miss an episode of Andy Staples on three. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the on three sports YouTube channel.